Views on this program are opinions of dental industry experts and not necessarily those of dentist advisors. Opinions shared in the following interview do not constitute personal financial advice. This program is furnished by Dentist Advisors, a registered investment advisor. You're tuned into Dentist Money Industry Expert Series. Now here's your host, Reese Harper. Welcome to the Dentist Money Show. This is your host, Reese Harper, and we're on a special edition with two close friends of mine on the Industry Expert Series today, Mr. Don Mantilla and Dave Mantilla, his son. I've known these guys for a long time, and I was really excited to have them in for the show, and uh, I'd like to start by just having you guys introduce yourselves. Don, uh, I'll be tell, tell people a little bit about yourself and how you came to be the, uh, the tax man. Sure, sure, Reese, and uh, thank you for having us today. Yeah, it's great. It's, it's great to be here, and uh, we'll try to add a little bit of uh, knowledge to uh, our experiences we've had. Uh, so, my uh, I've grown to uh, really appreciate and enjoy the, the dental profession. A lot of it happened in my early years. My father was a dentist and practiced for twenty plus years before he sold his practice. In that's his, interesting. Uh, How did 40s. I not know that? Yeah, I didn't you, know that. You didn't know that. That's interesting. cool. That's yes. really cool. So that that was. You got to see firsthand kind of right, how it went down. Right, right. And, and so just a little bit more uh, background is that I was actually pursuing a, a dental career, went to uh, the university, got a degree in biology, and uh, was going to go that path. And then for some crazy reason, I decided to uh, not do that and to pursue a, a business path and uh, then ended up with an accounting degree. And uh, so, but as a result of my father uh, kind of having introduced me to uh, the dental profession, understanding how it works in the home and uh, seeing a little bit about what he does with uh, what he did with his book work he called it at night I had a chance to get a little feel for the numbers and uh, and so now we service a lot of dentists and uh, enjoy that a lot we see uh, uh, there are great people uh, have a lot of great things that they do and uh, and we're excited to, to work with a lot of dentists that's awesome we'll have to I'll have to ask some more questions about seeing the Seeing dentistry firsthand, then sure, as they sure. go along, that's kind of cool. Yeah. And uh, Dave, how about you, man? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> so I, uh, you know, growing up in a household with a father who's a CPA, uh, I I kind of did the family books a little bit growing up and uh, got the bug for accounting, and I really that's cool. Love tying and footing, and no, I I, I like when things balance, I guess, but. Uh, so I graduated from college. I went and worked uh, in industry. I was a uh, um, worked uh, as an assistant uh, controller in a cost uh, cost accounting industry anyway, and then uh, joined the firm uh, in 2005. <clears throat> so I've been doing that and just uh, you know kind of following along in the footsteps of at least working with dentists. And so I'm uh, kind of our primary dental CPA. That's cool. Let's like jump into a few um, ideas or. You know, with these interviews, I like to focus on, you guys both have a lot of experience. You've worked with a ton of dentists. You've seen a lot of great things that they've done. You've seen a lot of mistakes. And I think what a lot of people try to figure out from getting expertise from people like you, especially on a on a, on a a show like this, is what are some of the mistakes that you guys see that are maybe the most common, either misunderstandings or mishaps that uh, you feel like Dennis make. Let's start with Don. I mean, you can talk about a, a one or two, and, and Dave, let's have you chime in and add to that as well at any time. Sure, Reese. Let's uh, talk about for a minute uh, one of the primary problems we see, especially with a, a newer practice, is a dentist comes out of uh, school with uh, a lot of debt. Generally, he also will a lot of times purchase, purchase an existing practice. So that means that he accumulates some more debt. A lot of times he will also then get into some personal debt, having a home and, and such. And uh, it seems like uh, a lot of uh, the younger dentists, which this is not a bad thing or a criticism by any means, but they have this desire to get out of debt as quickly as possible, and that's good. I mean, that's smart for a, a long-term perspective and planning. So what happens a lot of times is as, uh, as uh, collections start increasing, and the dentist uh, gets past his uh, payment of his uh, regular payables and uh, his bills each month, he sees this cash start to accumulate, and he says, well, I think what I'll do with that is is pay down some debt. And uh, a lot of times he won't consult with his advisor, uh, whoever that is, whether it's another uh, CPA, maybe it's his financial advisor or banker, whomever, and he won't necessarily 
talk about what's the what's the smart debt to pay down, and, and usually those are debts that have, may have higher interest rates and maybe of, of shorter term um, kinds. And uh, he takes all of his excess cash and and pays down debt without thinking about other ways that he may need that cash. For instance, uh, you you don't really understand how he is uh, he's accumulating a tax liability. You know when we start to have a cash accumulation, that means that there's going to be some tax. So just to slow down a little bit, because a lot of guys are, yeah. as soon as we start talking numbers, they're going to yeah. start uh, tuning out on us. Sure, sure, sometimes sure, I sure. do that. So yeah. so you're saying, I start out, I've got all this debt, and my collections kind of pick up. Right. I'm starting to see my business bank account have some cash in right. it. And my first reaction, since I've been told pay out of, get out of debt, and right. I've got all this debt piling up, is a smart thing to do would be, pay some of this stuff off. Right. But when I go to write that check and I pay that debt off, yeah. I don't realize that I, I've, I probably owe some taxes sometimes right. that, and I'm giving up my cash. Right. Now I've got no cash to pay the tax bill and I'm kind of in a bind and didn't realize that. Right. That, that's some one of the level. problems. Yeah. And, and when you've paid all that debt down with your existing cash, then it's tough to get that cash back to pay down, pay your taxes Yeah, if you owe them. I mean, what, what they, they really need to do, a dentist needs to do, is to get with an advisor and, and maybe do some planning. Talk about, here's how much uh, uh, I'm going to owe in taxes here, and at least put that aside so he can have that money, he or she can have that money set aside to pay the taxes, because there's always a a tax day, you know, a due yeah. date when that's going to be due. So I think people would be surprised, especially the younger guys, they'd be surprised to know that when I pay down debt, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, my income went down. That's, that's right. not a that's right. That's not a tax yeah. deduction. That's not something yeah. that makes my income go down, yeah, and, right? And, yeah, and, and I think and, people and, think that, that that is sometimes the case, right? Yeah. What do you think, well, Dave? Well, I, I think uh, I think that's one of the big keys is understanding you know, what is deductible. So it, it may decrease your cash, but it's not going to decrease your tax bill. And, and so understanding that, I think one other piece I wanted to add on to this is, you know, they've been deferring this tax liability for years and years. Uh, well, not years and years, but, you know, initially you have a lot of investment up front that you can write off and, and defer those taxes. Because of depreciation and yeah. things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, because uh -huh. you have accelerated methods and those have even increased now. You know, the IRS has made certain permanent and, and bigger amounts. So you can write off a lot more and I'll try not to bore everyone with that. But. These are the numbers guys here, people. <laughs> That's <Okay>. right. <laughs> They're smart. That's right. right. I'm not used to looking up by the and way. Back, just back it up for one second. If you, if, if I have, I think sometimes people don't understand the difference between income and a write off or depreciation or an expense. And I think it's just maybe important to clarify to, to people that, in, when you when you have income or when you make money when you're when you're finally showing some business checking account balance profit and you see stuff pile up that you you can do things to make that income go down and those things are things Dave was just mentioning right you can buy something you can incur an expense that'll bring your income down mm -hmm. but that doesn't necessarily it's 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 not always the right thing to do every year and uh you do need to make sure you got some cash around yeah. to pay taxes, like Don said, because you might think that throwing money at a loan brings that income down. Right. When it really doesn't. That isn't an expense, right? Correct. And paying money towards a debt is not an expense, and it's not something that makes your income go down. Yeah, and I think the uh, the downward cycle that they get into is they've been deferring those taxes. Now they've got a large tax liability but they may not necessarily have the funds to pay that tax liability, right? Yeah. And so what they do, oftentimes what I see, is they go and buy more equipment. And then, which is fine, maybe you need it, you know, but that's not, that's to me is an, you shouldn't buy equipment as a tax strategy. Yeah. You should buy equipment to build your company. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. That's super good advice. I think if you, um, if you ask yourself the question, you know, do, if I didn't get a write-off for this, would I still buy it? Right. Right. If it, if I was going to, uh, do you ever talk to clients about that, Don? I mean, we, we do all the time uh, because that's a question that's asked invariably every single year by pretty much every day. Should I buy this right. or buy that? Right. right. Yeah. And Dave, Dave makes a great point because he's right. It's not smart to spend money on something that's just a tax write off if you don't need it. 
yeah. a piece of equipment or extra supplies or, or whatever. You know, some some of those things just don't make sense. Uh, I was also going to say with regard to not using all your cash to pay down debt, we have found over the years if if a dentist is disciplined and will have a a structured plan for wealth creation or wealth building, in other words, setting money aside in a retirement plan, some kind of a, especially a qualified plan, a qualified retirement plan is like an IRA, 401k, something like that. That's a tax deduction, but it's going towards, uh, again, retirement. And so you, that's, that's kind of the best of all worlds because you get a tax deduction, plus you still have the money. It's your money in the future. So fair way to, I mean, I'm going to restate this from my the non-tax point of view. So the if I put money into a retirement plan or uh, put it aside, even if it's not in a retirement plan, you know that's that increases what I'm worth, right? That's I right. mean, my wealth is increased or what I'm worth is increased. Where when I buy a piece of equipment, I do get the short-term benefit of paying less tax, but we all know how much that equipment is going to be worth in five years. That's so right. while I got a short-term deduction, my wealth wasn't increased. You know, I didn't increase my wealth. Sometimes I think people, they run away from taxes to buy things right. that aren't going to be worth anything. And sometimes it's better just to, to maybe pay the tax at a, right. at a rate that is, you know, fair right. and, and start building some wealth. But, you know, I, I see people kind of running around making those decisions. Like Dave said, you know, it's kind of a, tough to know sometimes when, when you should defer the tax by buying a piece of equipment or doing something versus just pay the tax. Right. What do you guys, what do you usually tell people, Dave, when, when they're trying to make that decision, you know? Well, I think the, the biggest key is to look at tax strategy as an overall view, not just a, not with a short term concept in mind, like we've talked about. Like a about. tax minimization view is not necessarily the right paradigm. Right. You right. want a bigger picture. Bigger picture. Yeah. Because you know, and I'll give a quick example here that may or may not apply in, in most cases, but, but you know, at the very beginning of a career, you will have a lot of capital improvements and things that you can write off. Which makes beginning. your taxes be very... Yeah, your tax rate is low. Low. Yeah, and so I, I kind of make the argument, why save, let's say your tax rate's 15% right now, you know, why save something on 15% of a tax rate when you can defer it over five, seven years and then even increase that, you know, when your rate's going to go up to 35%. And so you kind of defer that. I understand time value, money, and all that considered. But still, overall, you, you probably are going to have a better tax savings. So if you're not just looking at so at year one, but you're looking at year two, year three, year four, et cetera, you know, your overall tax savings could be bigger. Man, that's, so, that's such good insight. I really like that. And I, I think sometimes people don't realize that, the, I don't think sometimes the way that taxes are paid Mm -hmm. I don't think they realize that there's not one rate they pay. Right. That there's a a set of rates. You know, we call you guys call that a tax bracket, right? Right. right. And if if I so if I wait sometimes to pay tax until next year, mm -hmm. it could be the equivalent of actually getting a rate of return on my money. Right. right? Because if if one year I'm in the twenty five percent bracket meaning if I buy a piece of equipment, I save 25 cents on the dollar mm -hmm. and I'm in November and it's painful because I know I'm going to have to pay taxes. So I'm real excited about this piece of equipment. Right. But by waiting even three or four months, because I know that next year I'm going to even have m more collections and more income, I could save anywhere from five to 10% potentially more by just waiting another calendar year than taking that deduction all in one year. Is that right. like a, an easy way to summarize it? Or how would you, would you say that any differently, I guess? Yeah. Trying to make it, how that well, makes sense. I, yeah, yeah, maybe let me just jump in a minute. So that's exactly right. And that gets back to the point I was uh, trying to make about planning. And Dave's saying the same thing yeah. is that we're tra talking about, you know, planning. Because if you have a, a long-term plan in place and thinking through it, He's right, and you're right, Reese, that you want to not necessarily even have that tax deduction this year, pay that low rate of tax, because in the future, because of our accelerated uh, rate rates here in the United States tax system, we will actually get a better bang for our buck. Yeah. Just to, just sometimes the, the way I think of it for some dentists is it's better to pay a lower average rate over your career than have kind of a wild swinging rate 
because a lower average rate means that you're doing good planning where if you're jumping kind of up and down in extremes, it, it, you may end up paying more tax than you would otherwise. Right. Anyway, that's, I think that's a really good concept to kind of highlight. And, um, the, I, I kind of, you know, to that as well, what do you guys, when, when people come and, and they say, I want to buy this piece of equipment, how do you guys determine whether you should expense it in one calendar year or maybe take, it over five or, or seven and wh what are their options and what does that really mean, you know, to, to take it over a period of time versus take it in one year. Right. And, and Dave alluded to this just a minute ago about under current tax law, and this law was just passed in December where it is now a permanent law where you're able to write off pretty much any, any piece of equipment you purchase. You have that option of writing it all off in the first year. In fact, you can even buy a piece of equipment and place it in service. In other words, put it to use in that on the last day of the year, December 31st, and you can write off the entire cost of that, whether you pay cash for it or whether you finance all of it or some of it. So if you bought a $20,000 piece of equipment, let's say, and financed all of it, you still get that $20,000 deduction that year. The problem with that is that you still have to pay the cash to pay off that debt in the future. So you are creating what Dave has said is about that you're deferring your tax liability. You're using all your you're getting a lot of tax savings, but you have to pay the piper, you know, at that, some point, at some point, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and life then, never gets cheaper. It seems right. like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you have the option of either writing off all in one year or the IRS has specified rates for different types of equipment or different types of capital purchase. They call them. Uh, so, uh, for dental equipment, for instance, uh, five years, is that right? Dave? Or is it five or seven years? Five years five is years. typical. Yeah. Yeah. Five years. So, yeah. So in other words, you can uh, buy that piece of equipment and you can write it off over five years, which may be the smart thing to do because, as Dave has mentioned, you're in a higher tax bracket in the future. And so those depreciation dollars that you're writing off on that, you get, get, you get a better uh, result. That's great. Better rate of return on that. So how, let's, ask, let's change directions here a little bit and, and say, Dave, you know, how early in the year do you kind of recommend people reach out to start doing, thinking about this kind of stuff? What, you know, what's, what's kind of, kind of the time frame? Yeah, well, that, that's one thing I was going to say is, you know, if my client comes to me in December and says, should I buy this piece of equipment? Hopefully we would have talked about this in April or May or June or something, you know. So I'll just say you need to have plan more than just in December and you definitely need to plan more than April the next year. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So you're saying most people kind of think about this after it's too late. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I understand. Yeah. And, and sorry to cut you off no, there. but okay. No, I, I understand that taxes are clearly my livelihood, you know? Yeah. And so I am thinking about it all year long. But I'm also trying to be proactive, reaching out you're to my You're kind of sick clients. like that. Yeah. Thinking about taxes exactly. all year, right? Exactly. Yeah. It wakes <laughs> me up. Wakes me up. But uh but, you know, that you should have proactive planning and a proactive advisor helping you throughout the year. Um, yeah. Not just when the extreme events come along, like a sell or a buy of a practice, I'm saying. But, you know, but, but you know, all throughout the year, you should be meeting maybe quarterly, um, you know, to go over the taxes, have clean records. I know you've mentioned, you know, having having good, good records, good books so yeah. that you can at the drop of a hat do planning. Yeah. You know, it shouldn't be this huge event once a year. I don't think people like to pay for planning, kind of like they right. sometimes we don't like to go do our exercise every day and right. some of the boring stuff that makes it so yeah. when we go skiing, we don't get injured because yes. we're doing some exercise yes. every day. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So so what 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 would you guys say the CPA's role is there though? I mean, this isn't this is isn't like a dig at the the industry, but right. a lot of guys will blame this on their CPA and they'll say, "Well, it's his fault. He didn't call me." And I know from my perspective, that's not, it's not that simple, you know, and there's probably a balance though, between the client being aware and trying to reach out and being proactive and then the CPA being proactive and it, it's probably not a one way street. Right. Right. And what, what's your perspective on that? I mean, how is it, is it easy to reach out and touch base with clients as often as they want to be called? You know, we, we were talking about that just the other day, how it, it, you know, you could say, and it, it probably is accurate, it's the advisor's, the CPA's responsibility to probably have a list of his clients and saying, I need to get with this person and this person and this person and reach out to them. Unfortunately, 
that doesn't always happen. And yes, we can blame the CPA. And, and yes, that probably is his fault and his responsibility. But Dave and I were talking about the clients we like the best, the dentists that we enjoy the most working with are those ones who have at least a, an understanding that they are going to pay some taxes at some point and they and they we'd like them to even reach out to us and say hey what if we got together and yeah. and uh, you know so so in other words it's easy to place blame we well, all do it, it all and, the time yeah but, that doesn't make the problem get better does that's it that's right not at and all I, I like to tell our clients that you know ultimately you're the entrepreneur you need to get a little bit of knowledge and use that knowledge to make some proactive decisions you can't outsource everything when it comes to tax or your finances and at some point you're going to pay the cost of neglecting you know that learning curve and and i think if if a client would reach out once a year in june or july or you know early fall it gives you plenty of time to kind of get your ducks in a row and make good decisions but i kind of feel like people just wait until the pain is there you know and and then that that can and in some cases you could probably say it's a two-way street though it's up to you know the client's got the ultimate responsibility but you know i think a little bit of prodding can help too so yeah i i think uh you know a dentist would certainly sell his patient on this that you know you need to uh have proper maintenance of your teeth throughout the year, you know, not just when you feel the pain of, of abscess or whatever, you know, yeah. that's not the time to go to the dentist. It's yeah, well that's before. Great. Yeah. That's great insight. What, um, what are some common tactics though, that maybe this is on the, on a different, different subject here. What's some common tactics you've seen people use to reduce their taxes that you wouldn't recommend, you know, things that people kind of chase or things that people kind of uh, say, I want to do this. This person said it's going to lower my taxes and that kind of give you some anxiety. Is there anything like that that you kind of are wary of as a CPA? Yeah, let me, let me jump in first and I'll let Dave uh, finish up here. I think that uh, I think what we're talking about here is when is a client becoming too aggressive? Uh, you know, and so what happens, we have seen uh, as a dentist, as his career uh, develops and such, he becomes, uh, pays, up, pays down his debt and uh, does very well that way. He tends to accumulate, again, some, some cash and some extra money, some disposable income. And he will uh, say, you know, I'd like to buy, let's just say, a boat, okay? And he will say, let's go out and buy a boat. And by the way, how can I write that off, okay? Yeah. And so he will... Uh, it's a business boat. It's a business <laughs> boat. Yeah, I take, I take patients out ha who happen to be my children and my wife and my cousins <laughs> and my aunts and uncles. And uh -huh. they're all patients of mine. So this obviously is a clear business write-off, right? Yeah. No. Yeah. It's, it's just it's just overreaching is what it is, and uh, that that's something. And, and it's either that or or other types of things, a motor home, uh, and uh, sometimes you know even a very expensive car. They don't understand that a very expensive car doesn't necessarily get it, get you any better deductions. And yeah. So uh, I think all three of those things aren't things that. Um, increase your wealth, right? They don't build your net worth. Right. It's kind of that, uh, which, are we letting the tax tail wag the dog, you know? And wh what's the, when is it, when is it to, um, when's it, when should you chase down a deduction versus yeah. keep the money and just get wealthier? Yeah. Those, are, those are just a few that come to mind. Dave, what other ones would you think of that? Well, yeah, I, I, my question was going to be, are we talking about gray areas? Is that where we're going? No, I'm just saying, <laughs> so. yeah, things that make you uncomfortable, you know, like yeah. as an, you know, or, you know, okay. I, I can list a few that I have seen people do and you guys could kind of tell me too, but go ahead and I'll, I'll let you finish this thought if you yeah. haven't. I, I mean, hopefully this isn't a tangent, uh, but, uh, you know, we'll have a, a client come to us and he'll say, my neighbor is getting money back and I'm owing. Why? And that's it. That's all the information that's the they context. give us. That's that's all we have. We don't know what that neighbor makes. We don't know if they've overpaid during the year. We can know nothing about it. We don't know where they are in their career anyway. And then we're asked to give a synopsis as to why their neighbor is getting money back and they're not. I think that's really good. That's a that we see that a lot where people make decisions big and and that will usually lead to a decision after they they have that happen, right? Where the neighbor didn't pay tax. Right. Consequently, I should be doing whatever someone else is doing. Exactly. 
and that's a different situation, you know, entirely. Their income's different. Their career might be different. Yeah. Amount of income. No one really talks about how much you made and, con- you know. Well, that's that's my that's what I always shoot back and I say, go and ask him what he made last year. I guarantee <laughs> you he won't tell you that. Yeah. You know? I think there's this idea that somehow taxes are negotiable based on the yeah. uh, savvy of the, the payer, like the the, right. the dentist, like the more savvy the dentist, the less he pays. Yeah. And the more savvy the CPA is, the more they can skirt around the IRS. Right. There's this common kind of underlying theme of, you know, that, that smart people can avoid paying tax. And I just think that's kind of, not everyone feels that way, but sure. I do think the less tax knowledge people have, the more they might feel that way. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and Don and I were talking about this too. Uh, you know, ultimately, both the preparer and the taxpayer sign that tax return. Yeah. And and I'm not saying that the taxpayer has to have a full working knowledge of what every piece is made up in that return, but they do need to understand that they have a responsibility to sign that and agree with what's being reported is correct. Yeah. You know. And and so we as advisors do our best to provide the most tax benefit you can get or whatever you want to call it, but ultimately you both sign that tax return. Yeah. That's great insight. Yeah, I think I think I think too often people feel like once that return's filed and it's done, they got they kind of got it. They got away with it. It's kind of behind them. Not until the statute runs out. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> just kidding. So I think we want to talk about that just real briefly. You know, just because I file a return a certain way, and I didn't get a phone call, mm-hmm. you know, what 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 am I liable for? You know, how long does 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 my tax return, is it available to be audited before it's kind of done and gone? You know, and I think that I don't think people will understand how filing a tax return really isn't the end of the decision on that return. Right. So can you explain yeah, that, that a little bit? That's a that's a great question. Uh, you know, how long am I liable to be looked at or audited or be responsible for back taxes? And there are. Uh, the, the the common number is is three years, but that three years is uh, is contingent upon a few different things. Uh, one of the things it's not there there are due dates when returns are due, and sometimes taxpayers get extensions uh, for the time to file the returns, and so you have to take those uh, additional months into account. And then there's uh, there's also a uh, requirement out there that you don't. Uh, substantially understate your your income not necessarily fraud but but sometimes people tend to well there's a big difference between understating income and uh and taking deductions i think sometimes people don't realize that those are very yeah they're very different things taking a an aggressive stance on a a deductions very different than hiding income Mm -hmm. from so so yeah so if you hide income i guess that's yeah let's talk about that if you hide income there is no statute in other words you're responsible forever when you rob the bank yes Mm -hmm. you are liable to give the money back (laughs) eventually eventually yeah forever (laughs) okay so uh and then deductions those uh are you know roughly three years my tax returns can be reviewed right is that that a fair way to look at it yeah Uh, that's right yeah understanding the deadlines, the filing deadlines, Don alluded to this, you know, so a typical individual tax return is due April 15th. If you extend, then you have until October 15th. And so the statute doesn't start until you actually file or, uh, or, or that extension date. Okay. And, and so that's one thing to keep in mind. Well, these have been great insights, guys. I think I'd let you just leave with uh, parting thoughts here about um, if you have anything you'd like to leave the, our listeners with to keep the dentist kind of moving in the right direction. Uh, Don, you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave? Well, just, just one other quick thought, and, and this is uh, something I've thought about common mistakes that dentists make, again, and that is a lot of dentists um, believe that they are only taxed on the money that they take out of the practice. And, and that's not necessarily accurate. And you'd say, well, that makes sense, you know, just thinking about that. Uh, so if I take out, let's say that um, I have a, a corporation where I get a salary, okay, through, uh, through my regular wages, and then I also take money out called distributions or draws. They, so, they, so they add those two together and say, well, that's my income. That's not true because the, the way the tax law works is you're also taxed on money that you've received in your practice, so collections, but you've elected to take that money and pay down debt. 
So the payment of debt is not, a, again, a tax deduction. So you're, you're, that's part of your that's taxable really income. Yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, or, or if uh, there's other things that add in there. So again, this is where planning has to come into play and, and uh, a good advisor would help you to understand what really am I going to be taxed on this year? Yeah, so if money piles up in my practice checking account, but I don't take it out, I'm still liable for that. You're still liable for that, right. If I right. pay down debt, right. I'm still liable for that. That'll That's right. still in, it's still income. That's, That's right. great insight. A lot of people have kind of miss that, I think, in an right. oversight. Well, thanks again, guys. It's been a pleasure. You did it. This is excellent information. Everyone's going to love it. We really appreciate it. And uh, look forward to having you guys on the show again. Thank you, Reese. Thank you, Reese. Thank you. Thank you.